Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. We'd like to thank you all for joining us on the second day of our annual research symposium. I'm so excited to be moderating Dr. Finn's keynote today. So far, we've heard from our wonderful student and corporate exhibitors, insightful keynote speakers, the STEM alumni panel, and many more, as I'm sure you know. I'm super stoked to continue learning about AI and automation through Dr. Finn's keynote. Before we start, I'd like to draw a couple of things to your attention. First, please feel free to answer any or ask any questions using the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. You may do so anytime during the talk. Please keep in mind that everyone in this webinar can see your questions. If you want to ensure that a question is answered, please use the Q&A to upvote that question. Time permitting, we will be inviting a couple of people to answer their questions live. We will open up the Q&A session once Dr. Finn has completed her talk. That being said, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Chelsea Finn. Dr. Chelsea Finn is an assistant professor in computer science and electrical engineering at Stanford University and a research scientist. Her research interests lie in the ability to enable robots and other agents to develop broadly intelligent behavior through learning and interaction. Her work has spanned the development of reinforcement learning algorithms that enable robots to learn manipulation skills through trial and error and meta-learning algorithms that allow machines to learn to classify new objects from only a handful of examples. She received her bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and computer science at MIT and her PhD in computer science at UC Berkeley. Her research has been recognized through the ACM Doctoral Dissertation Award, an NCF Graduate Fellowship, and the C.V. Ramamurthy Distinguished Research Award, and the MIT Technology Review 35 Under 35 Award. Her work has been covered by various media outlets, including the New York Times, Wired, Scientific American, and Bloomberg. Welcome, Dr. Finn. Thank you for the introduction, and I'm really excited to be here today and excited to share some of the work that I've done and, and, and share some of, I don't know, how I, how I got to where I am today. Uh, and, and also just, I don't know, to help you learn about some of, some of the things underlying technology, underlying artificial intelligence and robotics. And really feel free to ask any questions. I'm, this is really uh, all for you. It's not for me to, to, to be here and to talk. So uh, I'd really love to answer any questions you have or any, uh, anything that you're curious to learn about and so forth. So to provide a little bit more of an introduction, uh, I actually grew up in Pleasanton, California, which is not too far from Harker uh, and uh, also not too far from where I am now in Palo Alto. Uh, in middle and high school, I did uh, some kind of extracurriculars with first Lego League, building Lego robots. I was also swam competitively on the swim team and was in the marching band. Uh, at Amador Valley High School. Uh, and then in, at college, like was mentioned, I went to MIT uh, across the country and I enjoyed the weather there, uh, which is a bit different than the weather here in California. Uh, I was also continued to swim competitively uh, and also play in the wind ensemble as well. So maybe these are some things that you guys, you all can relate to uh, in some of the things that you spend your time on. After college, I did my PhD at UC Berkeley, coming back to the Bay Area. Um, I was part of the Berkeley Artificial Intelligence Research Lab, working on AI and robotics and some of the things that you'll hear about today. And I also continued to swim recreationally with an awesome group of people. Uh, and now I am at Stanford, uh, so also in the Bay Area again. Um, and I, I lead a lab at Stanford doing research on machine learning and robotics. And I also teach artificial intelligence and, uh, and, and robotics as well. Great, so that's a bit about my, my background and so forth. Uh, now, what about the research that I do and what I'm, what I'm really excited about and what I get up every day for? Uh, so I work a lot with robots. Uh, I'm really fascinated and excited about how robots might be able to perform tasks in the real world uh, and interact with their environment and generally show it broadly intelligent behaviors. And here are some examples of the kinds of things that we've, we've worked on robots, uh, the kinds of tasks robots have done that we've worked on. 
Uh, and in particular, I, I re I'm really fascinated by robots because I think that robots can teach us things about intelligence and what it means to be intelligent. Uh, this might seem a little bit silly because robots aren't very smart, but if we were to build intelligent robots, uh, they are faced with the real world. They need some sort of common sense understanding to do well. And so if we built robots successfully, then maybe we would better understand some of the challenges that intelligent machines are faced with when they have to interact with the real world. Okay, so to also back up a little bit and to look at things more broadly, I also want to start by talking about why I study artificial intelligence and robotics. And there's two reasons for this. The first reason is the potential societal impact. I think that there's just enormous societal impact in a range of different applications and sectors by building more capable systems, uh, more capable machines and robots. So in terms of the societal impact of robots, uh, if robots were able to intelligently interact uh, and, and go into various environments, then they could be used for search and rescue after natural disasters. They could perform dangerous and tedious jobs such as mining or deep sea exploration or manual labor. Uh, they could drive trucks and cars without distraction. I actually wrote one of my, my college uh, admission, my college um, essays when I was applying to college about driverless cars uh, and, and how it might be able to help reduce the number of accidents and so forth. Um, it could be used for space exploration like we've uh, seen recently uh, and also assist in surgery uh, and, and monitor crops and agriculture and, and so on and so forth. So I think that there's a lot of really interesting potential of what robots can do and can help humans and really contribute value to society. And I think that this is really exciting. Beyond robots and just in terms of artificial intelligence as a whole in computer vision and natural language processing, there's also really enormous potential impact as well to accurately diagnose diseases from images, to assist the blind and visually impaired, to try to predict the progression of wildfires, which is something that's particularly relevant in California, uh, to improve education, to translate between languages. This is something that's already provided a lot of value. Um, analyze outbreaks of diseases, identify tax fraud, uh, and, and more. Uh, and in particular, I think that for this kind of right column of things, where the real opportunity is, isn't necessarily that we can do these individual things, because these are things that people are pretty good at doing uh, as well, but it's the potential to be able to do these things at scale. Uh, in particular, if if we can do some of these things at a much broader scale, then we can bring them to uh, to um, to countries and places where they may not have access to these kinds of um, to people that do these sorts of things or to these kinds of technologies. Okay, so this is the potential societal impact. I should maybe also note that there's also risks associated with uh, artificial intelligence and, and robotics as well, and there are there are negative applications as well. And I, I don't mention these on these slides, but it is, um, I think it's also really important to acknowledge that these exist. And uh, in some ways, I think that this actually makes it even more important for people to work on these and understand what these techniques and technologies are capable of so that they can, so that we can try to ensure that the benefits and, and so forth of these vastly outweigh the potential risks. Okay, um, so that was the first, reason why I study artificial intelligence and robotics. Uh, the second is to further our knowledge. Uh, beyond just trying to make an impact on the world uh, in a very practical way, I think that perhaps by building more intelligent systems, maybe we'll be able to gain a better understanding of our own intelligence and, and understand how humans work. Uh, and this is uh, maybe a little bit more of an intellectual pursuit, but also a really fascinating one. Uh, it's, at least to me, it seems pretty amazing that every kind of going, you can kind of go from an embryo to an entire human that's really intelligent, that can do many different things, that can play sports, that can play games, that can interact with the world. Uh, and there may be actually a lot of other potential use cases and applications and things we might be able to do if we had a better understanding of what it means to be intelligent. Okay, so 
now that I've maybe motivated uh, some of the, the, the work that I do, uh, I have a question for all of you, and this will be rhetorical because uh, it's a bit harder to, to interact over Zoom, but I'd love for you to all think about how would you program a robot to fold any towel? In particular, say that you had this, uh, this red Sawyer robot here, and you wanted to program it such that it could fold any of the towels in this bin. Um, well, the red towel, the purple towel, the white towel, and so forth. So you can maybe take a second to think about that. Um, and let's maybe go through some of the things that you might think about doing. So one thing you might think about doing is programming the exact motions for the robot to go through, like program for it to like move its arm down and then program it to close its gripper and then move its gripper to another place and then open its gripper, for example. However, if you program exact motions, it won't be able to necessarily perform when the towel's in different positions or for different towels that need to be, that have kind of different, um, different thicknesses or maybe they're in different positions or different, yeah, orientations and so forth. So this is, an, this is kind of the approach that's actually used a lot in, uh, in manufacturing and in factories and so forth, but it's not something that actually allows robots to perform a task in a variety of different situations. Another thing you might imagine doing is giving the robot instructions, like telling it how to fold a towel, uh, like first grasp the corner or maybe grasp the side and then kind of drag it over and then grasp the corner and so forth. But if the robot doesn't understand the language that you're talking in, then it maybe won't be able, that won't necessarily be helpful for it solving the task. So I guess the reason why I'm asking you this is it kind of maybe gets across actually how difficult of a problem this is. Uh, and it's, it's, I don't know, so interesting to me that this is such a basic task for a human to do, and yet actually replicating it and understand how we do it and how we could actually create a robot that can do it in all sorts of situations is actually pretty challenging. Uh, and it's one aspect of robotics that I think is really interesting. And so there, there are questions that come up like, how should the robot see and feel? Uh, how should it kind of understand what the camera is seeing and translate that into its understanding of the current state of the world? And further, how should the robot choose what to do and what actions to take uh, when it's actually trying to fold the towel? And so this kind of breaks the problem down into perception and actuation, uh, perceiving the world and then actually taking action in the world. Uh, and a, a kind of a big core part of robotics is this perception action loop where you're perceiving the world and then acting based off of what you perceive. Uh, and then now getting back to how you would actually solve this task, the approach that a lot of my research takes is thinking about instead of trying to program or give very specific instructions for what to do, we want to see if the robot can actually learn how to solve the task from experience, essentially through trial and error of trying the task, seeing what happened, and then editing and changing what it did to try to solve the task more successfully. And this is exactly what's called reinforcement learning, where you try the task, you get some reinforcement of whether or not you did a good job or not, and then you try again based on what you saw and based on the reinforcement that you got. Okay, so that's maybe a bit of a warm up to start thinking about these kinds of problems. And so now I wanna get into a little bit of actually the technical meat of how we might get robots to learn from experience through trial and error. Uh, and I, I'm actually gonna start with a story here. Uh, that I was actually starting at the beginning of my PhD, uh, which was back in uh, 2014. And in particular, there was uh, a postdoc in the lab that I was working with that was trying to allow robots to learn through trial and error, just like I was mentioning. And in particular here, the goal is to get the robot to assemble the kind of wheel piece into this toy airplane. And it's again, a pretty basic task, but it's actually like from a technical standpoint of actually how you would get a robot to do this, it actually is a bit tricky. And if the robot can instead learn through trial and error, like you see here, uh, it can eventually be pretty successful as you're seeing here. And I was really fascinated by how, by this whole process, it kind of in some ways looks at like how a human might be learning, for example. 
Uh, and so I was really eager to, to work on this sort of idea uh, and try to see if we could push this idea for, further towards allowing robots to learn many different skills. And in particular, when at this point in time, uh, what this technique was doing is it was learning through trial and error. However, the robot actually had its eyes closed. Uh, it wasn't using any perception, any visual perception at all. It was learning this basically completely blind. And so to me, it seemed like the kind of clear next step was to try to figure out how we can get the robot to do this for tasks that require some sort of perception that require the robot to see the world and understand what it's seeing. Uh, so that's exactly what we did. Uh, we essentially tried to extend this algorithm to the case where it needs to place this red trapezoid block into the shape sorting cube. And the position of the shape sorting cube is changing. So it needs to actually look and see where the shape sorting cube is and use that when trying to figure out how to insert the task, yeah, insert the, the block into the cube. And over time, you're seeing here is the trial and error process uh, sped up a little bit. Uh, and over time, the robot is learning how to insert the block into the shape sorting cube. And it's actually learning both its perception system. It's learning both how to see and how to act at the same time. Um, and if you want to get into a little bit more of the details, uh, the in particular, in this case, there's a, a camera mounted uh, right up here. Um, and that's kind of the input to the algorithm, the input to the model that it's learning. And then the output is that it's actually trying to learn what torques to apply to each of the joints of the robot arm in order to actually solve the task. We were really excited about this result, that the robot can actually learn how to see and act at the same time. And we were excited about it, not because the robot learned this one particular task to put the red block into the shape sorting cube, but that you could take the same method, the same approach and apply it to other tasks. So here's an example of, of me holding the shape sorting cube. Uh, and you can see this is the robot's perspective right here. Uh, and so you can see that it could do it for different positions. Uh, but in addition to just using inserting the block into the shape sorting cube, the robot could use the same algorithm and learn how to place the claw of a toy hammer underneath a nail, shown here. It can also learn how to screw a cap onto a bottle. And again, you can see kind of the first person viewpoint of the robot here. This is what the robot is seeing. Um, and then with some uh, some improvements to the method, the robot could also learn how to, whoops. Uh, I hope this video will play. Okay, well, you can see the video on the top left. The robot could also learn how to use a spatula to lift an object and place that object into the bowl. It learned each of these things through trial and error. Uh, and some other labs also took this same method and applied it to their robots and the, ro the robots could learn how to hit a puck into a goal, how to open a door, uh, and how to throw an object to hit a particular target. Um, so this is all really cool. We're really excited about this seemingly general purpose approach to allow robots to learn different kinds of skills. And around the same time, some of these same sorts of techniques that were combining reinforcement learning with deep neural networks um, were also being applied to different games like Atari and the game of Go, uh, and also for learning locomotion, like learning how to walk in simulation. Uh, so this is a really exciting time, uh, but we have a bit of a problem. Um, despite the fact that this is really exciting and it's clearly a step forward in terms of these kinds of techniques, the problem is that the robot isn't kind of generally learning all of these skills, but the robot, what it had learned, for example, in this case, is that it had learned how to use that spatula to lift that object into that bowl in that environment. And the reason why this is, is that it was trained with that particular spatula and that background and so forth. And so the only data that it saw was from that one environment. And as a result, if you then put it in a different environment, gave it a different spatula or, some, or something else, it wouldn't actually be able to solve the task. It wouldn't generalize uh, to other situations. Essentially, this is because it was learning one task in one environment starting from scratch. 
Now you might think that, well, okay, we can maybe solve this problem. We just need to give the robot more spatulas, give it data of more spatulas, and that would kind of solve the problem. Uh, but it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. And in particular, if you look at actually behind the scenes, behind, uh, if you actually look at the learning process for some of these algorithms, oftentimes it looks something like this, where the robot attempts the task, and then a person comes in and kind of resets things back to where they were, and then the robot tries again, and so on and so forth, and this process is repeated. And one of the things you might notice here is, uh, this is my friend Yevgen, uh, and here Yevgen is actually doing more work than the robot is doing uh, in this whole process. And so it's not really practical to collect a lot of data and a lot of different scenarios if our learning process looks like this. And more broadly, if you think about this approach for training robots to do different tasks, it's kind of like kind of from day one, uh, the day that the robot kind of is, is, is trying to learn, day one is just you're giving kind of a baby a hockey stick and telling it, okay, you should learn how to hit pucks into a goal before you learn anything else about the world. And when you think about it this way, um, when you think about kind of learning entirely from scratch without knowing anything about the world, this maybe seems a little bit a little bit ridiculous. Uh, it seems a little bit kind of funny to really specialize the one the robot towards one particular thing rather than trying to train it to solve many different tasks and learn about the world much more broadly. Cool. So the the challenge here is that they're learning one task in one environment starting from scratch. And they're also relying on close supervision and guidance from people during the learning process uh, and learning in this really narrow setting. And this also actually isn't just a problem with reinforcement learning and robotics. It's certainly the most challenging in, in these settings, but also a lot of the other places where machine learning is used, they're still they're applied in more diverse settings, but they're still learning just kind of one thing and doing it from scratch without, uh, with a lot of detailed supervision. And so even though these systems can do one thing particularly well, that doesn't mean that they can do all sorts of other things. They're kind of what I would call specialists because they're specialized towards one particular task and one particular part of a data distribution. Okay, so, Specialists can certainly be very useful. Uh, I'm not saying anything against specialists. And for example, a system trained for machine learning, machine translation for translating from one language to another is super, super useful. However, if we want to kind of move towards robots that are useful in a broad range of situations and can do many different tasks, then we need to move beyond these sorts of specialists. I want to think about how we can build robots that are generalists. And in particular, we could look at um, kind of bringing back the analogy that I mentioned before of giving a baby a hockey puck, a hockey stick and having it learn how to shoot goals. Instead, maybe we should train robots a bit more like how humans learn. Uh, maybe they should kind of interact with the world, play with a diverse range of things, learn many different things like uh, rolling around on the floor, like picking up objects, like playing with toys and so forth, rather than trying to have them specialize for one particular thing. Um, and it turns out that if you actually, I mean, here on the left are some examples where AI techniques have been applied very successfully. And it turns out that even these like really basic object manip manipulation skills where you want to interact with toys, these really simple yet general manipulation skills are actually currently beyond the scope of current techniques and current technologies in comparison to the techniques that have been successful in kind of narrow game-like environments and so forth. Uh, and even I mentioned before that the game of Go is one area where AI has been applied uh, and it's actually done quite well, but uh, we actually also don't have the technology for a robot to manipulate Go pieces in a very general way either. Uh, and so it, there's actually this kind of funny paradigm here where these really simple things that uh, simple but broader capabilities are actually harder than the narrower but more complex systems. Um, and this is actually known as Moravec's paradox, uh, that 
the things that seem so intuitive and simple to us are actually harder to construct in robots and machines than the things that are seemingly more complex but narrow. Um, and so I guess what some of the things I wanna focus on in, in the next portion of the talk is thinking about whether we can build robots that do these seemingly unimpressive things, but things that are potentially more fundamental to intelligence and potentially more in fundamental to how humans interact with the world. Okay, so um, how do we actually go about doing this? So the first step is we'll collect some diverse data more akin to the, the baby rolling around on the floor by essentially scripting the robot to do certain behaviors that are more like playing with objects and playing with towels, for example. And in contrast to the problem of like learning how to assemble the toy plane, there's really no notion of progress or success here. Uh, and so the learning problem actually becomes a little bit more difficult because you don't have any clear objective of what you're trying to do. You're trying to learn about the world much more broadly. And so what we do is after we collect data, we train these robots to predict what will happen in the future. Essentially, we'll, we'll train the robot to generate videos that look like this and imagine if it took actions in the world, imagine kind of what the images would look like in the future. So these are actually videos generated by um, the robot's model. And these kinds of models that are learning how to predict the future, they capture actually general purpose knowledge about the world. They, they capture things like objects, like for example, um, in this video right here, you can see that it learns to predict that the stapler will move when the robot pushes towards it. So it's learning things about physics, about objects and so forth. Um, these also use all of the available information in uh, the data that it collected. And there's also no assumptions about the particular representation of the world that the robot has. And so you can apply these same kinds of models to things like towels and the robot can learn that if it kind of goes down and grasps and moves things that the towel will, the towels will move with it, for example. Okay, so to get a little bit more into the details briefly, how do we actually build these models that can predict the future? Um, what it does is it's use what's called a deep neural network uh, and it trains that deep neural network with supervised learning. And basically what we do is we collect a lot of data that has an image, an action, and a next image. This is basically just videos that I showed you before, except you're also recording how the robot moved its joints. And once you have a lot of data of this form where you essentially have a big data set that has all of these things in it, then you can train essentially this big neural network uh, to generate what the next image will be. Um, so you can basically tell it when I give you this image and this action, this is the next thing that you should predict forward. Um, and so we, this is kind of an example of what a neural network architecture looks like where it takes as input an image, it applies these different nonlinear functions that have different parameters uh, and then it eventually outputs the next image. Uh, and it, all of the kind of parameters, all of the, um, there are a lot of different parts of this model that are actually trained and, and actually optimized using the data that you have. So this is the first image, this is the action here, and this is the next image. Okay, so, and this is uh, kind of like one of the, use one of the kind of building blocks of, of machine learning. Okay, now once we have this model that can predict the future, that can predict what to do next, then it's a matter of how do we actually accomplish tasks using that model? Uh, and this is where planning comes in. So the way that we do this is actually quite simple. Um, you can think of it as essentially say, okay, say this is the, the image that the robot sees. Maybe the robot wants to go over and like pick up this, um, this toy drill over here. What we do is we consider a lot of different potential actions the robot could take, a lot of different things that the robot could do. We then predict the future, predict what the robot thinks will happen if it takes all of those actions, each of those actions. So here are two potential things that the robot could do. 
then we predict what will happen if the robot does, does those two things. And then we take the future that is closest to what we want to accomplish. So for example, for picking up the drill, maybe this one is a little bit closer because it moves the, the hand towards picking up the drill. And we perform that action on the robot. Uh, then we've kind of gotten closer to accomplishing our goal. And we can essentially then iterate this process and have the robot iteratively refine the things that it's planning to do uh, in order to actually eventually solve the task. Um, and if you want to know that kind of the technical term for this, this is called like visual model predictive control or visual MPC. Okay, then there's one last question that comes up in this process, which is how do you determine if a future video that the robot predicted is a good one? Um, and there are a few different ways that we have humans specify a task to the robot. Um, one is by kind of basically giving the robot this blue arrow by telling it you want it to put the apple onto the plate or giving it this blue arrow to say that you want it to essentially pick up the towel and cover the object with the towel. We can also provide an image of what we want the robot to do. For example, if we want it to grasp an object, we could give it an image of it grasping an object. Um, and we've also developed techniques where you can just show it a few examples of what you want to accomplish, like putting the fork on the right of a plate. Okay, so that's essentially um, essentially the technical approach. Uh, and then once you actually learn this predictive model and are using it for planning, a human can specify a goal, like saying that I want you to fold this leg of these shorts. And then you consider a lot of different actions and you run this through your, your model that's predicting the future. And then you predict one future that looks more like it's accomplishing this goal than all the other futures. And then you take these actions and apply them on the robot. And you can then get the robot to kind of somewhat approximately uh, fold this leg of the shorts. So that kind of walked you through step by step how you might get a robot to essentially fold a towel. Um, Another example of, of providing a task specification is you could instead give the, give the robot five examples of success, like putting this pencil case behind the notebook. Then it actually infers a classifier to uh, predict whether or not an image is uh, accomplishing the goal or not. Then you run predictions through your, through your model of the future, and you then run this planning process, and you can get the robot to kind of successfully move its arm in a way that will accomplish the goal of putting this pencil case behind the, uh, behind the notebook. Okay, and as a few more examples of what you can do, here's an example of the robot grasping the stuffed toy, given the task specification. Uh, you can also tell it that you want it to move the sleeve of the shirt over here, and it can figure out how to do that as well. Um, and here's the example of putting an apple on a plate. So the robot figures out um, what actions to take that will kind of accomplish this goal of putting an apple on a plate. Um, and there's kind of a number of other examples as well. And the really cool thing about this that's different from everything I showed you before is that it's actually using a single model for all of these different tasks. So instead of just learning one really narrow skill, it's learned something that allows it to accomplish lots and lots of different things. Okay, then you might say, okay, these, these skills are kind of simple. Um, can we make them a little bit more interesting or have the robot do things that are a little bit more complex? Uh, and in particular, we then, after this project, tried to incorporate some human guidance into the process to allow the robot to learn more complex skills. Um, and so, the form of guidance that we considered is demonstrating the robot how to use a tool or how to use an object as a tool. So this video you can see Annie is essentially guiding the robot arm through the process of using a tool to push the objects over here. Um, and what we can do is we can actually use those demonstrations like that and use that to improve each step of this process in order to allow the robot to do more complex skills. So we collect a bunch of the demonstrations like the ones that I showed on the previous slide. We'll add these to our data set of 
our data set of trajectories or data set of videos in order to improve the model. And then we'll also fit a model of the behaviors that the robot was doing in order to actually improve these other two parts of the process as well. So we can actually fit a model to what the human was doing in the demonstration data. Then we can actually use that to direct the data collection process towards these more interesting and complex interactions that you see to collect more interesting data, which will then improve the model. And then also you can use it to guide the planning process as well. So that when you consider lots of different action sequences, you don't just consider random potential things that you can do, but you consider things along the lines of what the human was doing as well. Cool, so kind of some examples of the kinds of uh, demonstrations that they gave, we gave the robot looks something like this. And then if we actually take this model of the human behavior and run it through, um, kind of show some examples of how it's modeling the human's behavior, we get examples that look like this, where you see that it kind of learned different behaviors like um, going towards an object and, and moving it in a certain way, um, or maybe trying to grasp um, one of the kind of pieces of, of trash here. Okay. Um, and then in terms of how this works, uh, again, we'll tell the robot a goal that we want it to do. Like maybe we tell it that we want it to move these objects over here, but we don't tell it how to do the task. We just tell it that this is what we want it to accomplish. And then we run the planning process to figure out what the robot should do in order to accomplish that goal. And so this is a, a, a prediction of the future that the robot has generated that it thinks will solve this goal. And then we can run the corresponding sequence of actions on the robot according to this prediction of the future. And the robot can, uh, can mostly solve the task. Okay, and then again, uh, because this is an approach that's learned with lots of data and it's learning this kind of general purpose model of what the future will be based on what it does, is you can actually use this single model for many different tasks again. So we can tell it that we want it to put objects into a dustpan and the robot can learn how to sweep objects into the dustpan. Um, in this example, we told it that it should move the blue object closer to itself, but we constrained the motion of the robot to this green region. And so the robot, ha if it wants to get, bring the object closer to itself, it actually has to use the hook. And it figures out that to use the hook, it has, or to, to, it figures exactly, figures that out. So it figures out that in order to move the blue object closer to itself, it has to grasp the hook and, and move the hook closer to itself, as you see here. Um, it can also solve tasks with objects it hasn't seen before. So this is an example uh, where we tell it to move the red objects off of a plate. And it figures out that if it grasps the sponge and moves the sponge, uh, across the plate, then it can actually wipe the objects off successfully. And then it will also use objects that aren't really tools that we necessarily think of as tools like this, this water bottle to also solve a task if it thinks that it can solve a task. Uh, so in this sense, the robot is kind of sort of improvising in a way. It's using an, whatever object it sees in its environment in order to try to solve the task. Uh, and then lastly, you can figure out when to use a tool and when not to use a tool. So if there are a couple objects in the scene that it wants to move over to the left, then it figures out that using the hook to move them across is a good idea. Whereas if there's just a single object that it needs to move, it figures out that it's probably just faster to, to move the object directly. Cool, so these are uh, some of the cool things that we can get, uh, get robots to do, and in particular, one of the reasons that I am really excited about these sorts of results is that the robot didn't learn how to do just one thing. It could actually do many different things uh, in its environment. Uh, and it's getting a little bit closer to the kinds of the kinds of simple but general behaviors that we see humans are able to do. Um, and the last thing I wanted to mention here is we actually brought the robot down to a conference called NeurIPS, uh, which is actually the top machine learning conference. We did this back in 2017, which was in, in Long Beach, California. So we were actually able to drive the robots down. 
Um, we drove them down and we actually uh, showed a demonstration of the robot to different researchers in this area. Um, we demonstrated some of our separate work on imitating humans and also the work that I just described on using these visual models of the future to plan. Uh, and we also actually did a demonstration for this uh, AI for All camp at Berkeley. There's also a similar camp at Stanford as well uh, for high school students. Uh, and the high school students weren't very impressed, uh, of course. Uh, and this is because these are kind of the really simple and, and the, the unimpressive things that humans are so good at, but are fundamental to, uh, yeah, to what we do. Uh, but they also still had fun. Okay, cool. So that's the last part of the technical part. Um, and I was gonna end a little bit by talking about my path towards artificial intelligence um, before, maybe, before maybe going through the questions. Um, so how did I get to where I am today? Uh, I mentioned this a little bit on the first slide, but I can talk a little bit more about it in detail. Uh, the first thing that brought me to where I am today is I really love solving puzzles. Uh, this includes things like jigsaw puzzles, but it also includes things that are, I don't know, problems that we don't know how to solve. And I really feel like everything that I do today is in many ways like solving puzzles, but puzzles that have maybe some real societal implications uh, and also puzzles that are really difficult uh, and puzzles that no one has figured out how to solve yet. And that's essentially what I, how I think about, how I uh, think about engineering and a lot of different fields in technology. Cool, and so essentially the goal of my job is to solve puzzles and teach others about what I've learned, which is in my mind, a pretty cool job. Um, I also really had no plans of being exactly where I am today. Uh, I really like solving puzzles, I like engineering, uh, but I wasn't really planning to become a professor. Uh, and part of what got me here was actually relying and being inspired by mentors. So my advisor at MIT, Seth Teller, uh, is one of the reasons why I decided to do a PhD. Uh, he was just so excited about the research that he was doing and it was really encouraging for me to do, go down that path. And it really wasn't something that I had considered when I started undergrad. Um, and after that, Alice and Okamura, um, it's actually one of the reasons I first considered becoming a professor. Uh, it didn't really initially seem like a career that I was necessarily considering, but it turns out to be a pretty cool job. Uh, and so I'm kind of thankful to both Seth and, and Allison, uh, as, as well as many others for, uh, for their mentorship. And uh, yeah, it's, it's great to, I don't know, I think that there's always, behind any person, there's always mentors and support uh, that's helping them get to where they are. Beyond that, what prepared me to work on AI? Uh, so for those of you uh, who are high school students, um, there are a lot of classes that I still use today, including calculus and everything leading up to calculus, as well as statistics and computer science. Um, and so I, I took AP Calc, I took AP Stat, I took computer science uh, in high school, and those are all things that I still use today. Um, a lot of the coding that I've done is in Python. Uh, I know this isn't actually what's taught in AP computer science these days, uh, but things like Java are actually pretty easy to a lot of the things you learn in Java are translate into Python. Um, I also do have I've done a number of a little bit of C++, HTML, and ROS, which is like a, a robot operating system, um, and also things like CUDA. But most of it is Python. Um, and some of my favorite Python packages are things like TensorFlow and PyTorch, uh, Matplotlib, which is great for visualizing things, and so forth. Um, also, when I was deciding to choose my college major, I actually wasn't fully decided. I was mostly considering these three things because they all seemed really cool and exciting. Uh, I ended up picking computer science, uh, as you may have inferred. Uh, and the reason why I did this wasn't because I was particularly excited about computers relative to these other applications, but because it allowed me to keep my options open. Uh, when you do computer science, it's actually, um, it teaches you a lot of different tools that can be useful for a wide range of applications. Uh, like robotics, I also considered doing some things in, in, in biological engineering after my undergrad as well. Uh, and it's, I don't know, it's a really awesome major uh, and a really awesome thing to be a part of. Um, and then also, the, I think the last thing that prepared me to work in AI is really seeking out things that I loved and working hard at them. Um, I think that 
yeah, when you love something and when you really enjoy working on something, it's easier to work hard because uh, it doesn't really feel like work. It feels more like play and so forth. Uh, and then lastly, because um, because I think that the representation of women isn't uh, quite where, where I would like it to be at least, um, I'd like to also highlight some of my really amazing colleagues at Stanford uh, who are all Stanford professors in computer science or mechanical engineering. Um, so uh, for example, Dorsa works on human robot interaction. Emma works on theoretical reinforcement learning and AI for education. Karen works on computer animation and assistive robotics. Uh, Jeanette works on robot perception. Fei-Fei works on computer vision and AI for healthcare. And uh, Allison, who I mentioned, uh, works on robot teleoperation and soft robotics. Uh, and they're all really amazing. I'm not the only one, I'm not the only uh, woman faculty, of course, uh, in the computer science and mechanical engineering departments. And uh, I think, I don't know, they all inspire me and, and uh, yeah, wanted to show a few more cases. Great, and happy to go through some questions. Uh, and yeah, I'd also like to thank uh, my students, uh, some of whom are, are shown here before, when we had a retreat before the pandemic. Awesome. Thank you so much for your incredibly fascinating presentation, Dr. Finn. I know I definitely learned quite a bit. And I would say like personally, I appreciated your little personal touch to the talk when you discussed why you chose to study AI and automation. Um, I just like to say on behalf of everyone, hearing you speak with such passion about your work definitely motivated me, motivated me. and I'm sure other attendees to dive really deeper into the field. I also particularly enjoyed the visual component to your presentation, um, watching the trial and error process through your videos. So to start things off, we can get to the first question. Um, what are your thoughts on how far we should go in developing robots? Is there a too far in how similar robots can be to humans? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that there, are, it's, it's kind of an interesting question because in terms of, I think that, I don't necessarily think of it as how far, because I think that there's kind of many different paths you could, you could advance technology. Um, I think the main risk with uh, with developing technology is that is is when people use it in situations that aren't appropriate. And I think that one risk with robotics in particular is that there may be situations where robots are replacing the work that humans could be doing. Uh, and I think that's a maybe that's a, a longer topic and a longer discussion. I think that there's uh, many different considerations on both sides. Um, I think that the, in terms of developing the technology, well, first I think that we're like kind of in many ways still in the infancy of these technologies. And I think that there's so much to do to even get it anywhere near the kinds of really basic things that humans can do. Um, and second, I think that I, I do, well, this is maybe uh, more of kind of an opinion, but at least in my opinion, I think that it's worth advancing our understanding and advancing the technologies and um, and always just being wary of the various implications and the various risks of them and studying both the risks as well as the benefits at the same time so that we can get a full understanding of it. Um, and yeah, maybe I'll, I'll leave it there. I think that there, I think that there's, I personally think that we should keep on advancing them much further because I think the potential for, for good is much greater than the, the the risks, but um, it's something that we should be consi consistently looking out for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, how you weighed the pros and cons, I think, is also super interesting. So I'm sure everyone was glad to hear that. Um, our second question today, um, instead of having a robot do everything on its own, why don't we have robots observe humans perform general actions, therefore learning easily without needing close guidance? Yeah, that's a great question. I guess first I'll mention it, in some ways this is exactly what Dorsa works on. She works a lot on the intersection, the interaction between humans and robots. Um, that said, we actually have, we have been working on that a bit. We also think that's a, a promising approach. So uh, I didn't really talk about this in detail, but in, in these videos, for example, you, you saw right here that a human kind of showed the robot what to do, like closing a door. And then the robot learns how, uh, kind of learns how to perform the task like this. 
Um, and so in general, I think that this is a really promising direction. Also, these kinds of algorithms, they like using a ton of data and, or I guess they, in order to generalize, in order to perform in a wide, broad range of environments, they need to be able to see data of a broad range of environments. And so one really promising direction that I'm excited about that's really on kind of the forefront of the field is seeing if we can leverage data from the internet of of videos of people doing things. If we can have, get lots of data of people doing things, then robots may, may be able to look at that, observe that, and be able to perform lots of those different things as well. Uh, and it's, yeah, a really, a really great source of data and a great source of information for training robots. Yeah, um, I find it super fascinating that there's so many multiple like avenues that a robot can take to learn. So that's super cool as well. Um, Annika in the chat um, is asking, how have teams been tackling the challenge of COVID-19? What has been different and what has been the same? Yeah, so a couple of thoughts there. Um, the first thought is in terms of our own research, uh, it there have been some impacts and the, the research that we've been doing in person on robots has been a little bit more limited. And we've had to, we've been following certain restrictions from the university, like social distancing, wearing masks and so forth in order to ensure that all the research that we do is safe. Uh, and also this video right here, um, this is actually a robot, a small low cost robot in uh, a Stanford undergrad, Annie Chen, that's in her home. Uh, and she was actually doing all of her experiments at home um, rather than working in the lab so that she could um, social distance and everything as well. Um, so that's how it's been affecting our, our research. And then more broadly, I think that the pandemic is one example of a situation where robots could actually be quite impactful. Uh, because if, if, for example, it's not safe for humans to come into contact, it might be safe for robots to do some of the things that might require humans to come into contact and uh, allow it, yeah, it's basically just another example where we might be able to allow robots to help in situations that would be dangerous for humans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely an interesting application. Um, our next question, uh, what are your thoughts on Boston Dynamics and their robots? Um, have you worked with them? Would you consider developing robots for sale in the future? Yeah, so for the, for the first question, um, their videos are always always inspiring and interesting. A lot of the work that they do is on allowing robots to learn how to walk and, and run and do various maneuvers that all involve mostly the legs of the robot. Um, and the, there are, they actually use a different class of techniques that don't use any learning in the process. And I think that these techniques are actually pretty suitable for the kinds of problems for like training legs to walk and so forth. Uh, but they actually aren't very suitable for the kinds of problems that I showed you today. Because when you actually wanna manipulate objects, when you wanna interact with various different objects in the world, perception and how you actually see the world is a really important part of the process. And there's also just a ton of variety in the kinds of objects that you might see, the kinds of configurations of objects you might see and so forth. And the kinds of techniques that Boston Dynamics develops actually is very poorly suited towards that. And actually a lot of what they do doesn't involve any perception. The robots are essentially blind in a lot of the videos that you see. Uh, and the environment is just put in a certain way that it doesn't change too much, for example. Um, so in general, I think that the, the videos are, are all really cool, but they um, a lot of those techniques aren't directly applicable to these kinds of problems. Um, I think the second part of the question was something about uh, developing robots for sale in the future. Um, the work that my lab does is mostly on the software of the robot and less on the hardware. Um, so for example, all of these robots are robots that we purchased, um, ranging, yeah, the, all of them are robots that we purchased. Uh, some of my students are interested in, in building companies after their PhD. And so they might develop techniques that eventually make it into consumer products or, or um, or other services for companies and so forth that might benefit from these kinds of robots. Uh, but the technologies aren't quite there. 
aren't quite there yet. Um, and there's actually a lot of effort to go from a little research demo to a product and service that's reliable and so forth. Um, but it's something that, that we're considering. And as we develop these technologies, we can see what's really promising and, and hopefully maybe translate that into real technologies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Um, and our final question for the day is by using the predictive model of videos for learning, how do you develop abstractions? So for instance, if the training data contains videos of robot picking a pencil and releases it outside of the surface and learns that it falls, will the model predict that an object very different from a pencil will also fall? Yeah, this is a great question. There are some components of the architecture of the model that will lead to it um, learning certain kinds of abstractions because it actually learns how um, it learns how kind of the image in one frame will kind of transform into the next frame. And so it learns that there's some amount of coherence. Um, and one of the architectures that we've worked with essentially is kind of segments the image and then translates different segments of the image. Um, in general, though, all of these sorts of abstractions are things that it has to learn from the data. Uh, and so it has to learn about physics, it has to learn about whether an object will fall, how an object will move through the data that it sees. Um, and so it will predict, uh, predict different things differently. So for example, um, for rigid objects, it generally, th these predictions are a bit blurry because it's an older model, but um, it generally knows that it's a rigid object. Whereas for things like towels, it very clearly knows that it's a deformable object and that it will deform and, and change in contrast to the stapler. Um, so the model will will predict those different pro diff it will predict things differently based on the properties of the object, based on what it saw in the data. Okay. Um. Yeah. I I would just like to say, just every day, I get so amazed by robot like capabilities, and I thought you uh, showcased that perfectly in today's keynote. Um. Big thank you once again to Dr. Finn for this amazing keynote presentation. And thank you so much for everyone for um, attending our last keynote of the symposium. As you head off, um, you know, we just wanted to tell you, like, thank you so much once again. And uh, you know, we hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you again, Dr. Finn. Yeah, thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that all of you are a part of this. And yeah, really excited to be, be a part of it as well. That's great. Um, you can look forward to the Harker panel discussion, um, which talks about the Harker research program as a whole. So stay tuned for that.